I think what you were saying just then um, highlights a lot on this idea of an experience that rearranges you, like Bishop Barron talked, like the rearrangement of possibilities. Basically, we need to think um, of what would it look like to have education, institutions, or communities in which the possibility of people being rearranged was much higher and could occur. Um, because that basically is the prerequisite for global pluralism not to turn into an, a, to regress, to be a kind of disaster. Like a lot of people's lives are changed because they had an English teacher who said like the stories of English teachers who change everyone's lives is like through the roof, right? Like, so there are like, like right now, it kind of feels basically random, dare I say, on who is able to say do philosophy or do arts, who has their potential rearranged. They just happen to have a grandfather. They just happen to do this coach. And, and there's always going to be some degree of randomness that is part of the picture. But if there is a meaning crisis, then there's a lack of um, conditions of, that are necessary for enough people, more people, on average, to encounter experiences of rearrangement that would make them realize they're actually capable of just diving in to global pluralism, not knowing the topic ahead of time, and they can make it work, right? Like, because what you're talking about is you can always come up with reasons not to do something. Always. Uh, there's always reasons not to do something. The reason to do something is found in the doing, but that means you have to dive in. Um, a way to put it is I'm not sure, I doubt anyone has learned to swim who didn't jump in the water. Likewise, no one really learns how to be human or to be creative or being able to like work in the cipher who doesn't just dive into it. And I think what that gets into is how basically what humans need is not a point, but a situation. Like, because what's being described, like we were talking at the net of the other day of like, what's the point of philosophy, the point of the net or the point of these discussions. And there's something about the bravery it takes to do something pointless like you don't know the point, but it actually changes you as, as a subject to do something that may not have a point. I didn't say, you know, one of the things I was thinking about after that conversation is how it's actually, I think sometimes the fear of pointlessness is greater than the fear of death. Like I think it can sometimes be easier to face death than to face the possibility of pointlessness. Ironically, the fear of pointlessness results in the meaning crisis. Like the fear of not having meaning of doing something meaningless results in you never taking the plunge in which meaning is found. Uh, what you fear is what comes unto you. If you're afraid of doing something and doing a bad job or doing something that's pointless or doing something that's meaning, then that guarantees it. <laughs> you have to jump in. And funny enough, philosophy is pointless because philosophy is a situation. It's a way of life. Art is pointless because art is a situation. It's pointless because it's a higher geometry. It's not something with a point. It's a mode and way of being in the world. Many things that are pointless are actually situations. And you could say that the meaning crisis is a situation crisis, per se. It's a lack of situations in which people dive in to find their true selves, right? It's like the phrase, and Raymond makes this point, where when Socrates and all of them say, know thyself. Know thyself is a phrase of going to the gymnasium. You know yourself by finding out if you can climb a mountain. You don't know yourself by asking internal questions of what's going on. You know yourself when you do something hard, when you do something you're scared of, when you try to climb a mountain. So knowing yourself, the philosophical knowing yourself, the themos, as I was saying with Aspasia, is found in situation, not in point. Like, what's the point of your existence? Well, like, it's X, Y, and Z or whatever. It's like, well, they're, they're, I don't know. And if you find a point, the only way to find a point for the human being is reductionism. You have to reduce yourself to a single quality and say that's your point, right? But if you want to know yourself and it not be reductionist, then, it, then you must be a situation. Well, how do you be a situation? That means you have to throw yourself into something of which you will always have reason not to do. This is the key. Like if you want to have meaning, you have to face the reasons not to do something. So there's always a courage. Like Alex Ebert has said, the meaning of life is courage. I like that phrase. Because you literally have to just do it. And likewise, a good society will rearrange the possibilities where you see yourself as, yeah, I just need to do it. I just need to jump in and kind of take the dive, right? Because like, like to the point, very often people are like, how do I write more? Well, 
Talking about writing might just be a point. The question is, how do I enter the situation in which writing just flows out of me? When you say, oh, I should do more philosophy. No, you need to find the situation in which philosophy just flows out of you, or you just find yourself reading philosophy. You need to find the situation in which these things just happen. And that is entering into a proper space. That is entering into the creative unfolding. That's entering into relations and communities where you find yourself just doing these things because it just happens. You're like, oh, I guess I'm philosophizing now. Oh, I guess I'm writing. You just find yourself doing it. But you see, the problem is when people are like, I want to write more, they then tend to look for a point. What should I write? Well, the best writing is pointless. The best writing is situational in a weird way. Like, like if you ask, what is it? Let me, let me explain it this way. If you ask, what is the point of Hamlet? It's reductionist. The point of Hamlet is Hamlet. It is the entire situation of the book. It is the perpetual unfolding of many interpretations through history. It's a million points. Just like a room is not a point. A room is many points connected by relations that make geometrical space, right? So Hamlet is not the point. The moment you ask, what is the point of Hamlet? You're treating Hamlet like an equation versus a play. You've taken a situation and made it algebraic, right? So like another way to put it is, I think Walker Percy said, a novel is an emotion that could be expressed no other way, that there was no other language for. Like the language to describe the emotion was the entire novel, right? So a novel is a situation. It can't have a point without not being the novel. Now, of course, you can talk about points in so much as you bring them back to situations. You can reduce things to the price of being $200 as long as you don't forget that it's something more than the $200. But it, that is not easy for the brain to remember. The brain tends to reduce things and then forget that it reduced things and treats the thing that it's reduced to as the thing itself. That's the problem. The brain has a tendency to reduce and keep it reduced. And now it's not reduced. It just is a point. Well, now it's small. And, and you forget that it could have been something else. And that's kind of a spiritual blindness that occurs. That's, that's the spiritual blindness that you were saying of reductionism. It's that you reduce and then you forget it was never not reduced. And then you're blind. And now you're in a meeting crisis, right? So, the, yeah. and then because you get so used to everything being reduced, you're looking for points. What's the point of this? Because all you've ever experienced is the point, the gist. What's the price? Tell me what the topic is. All you ever do is experience things as points. And then you come into something like philosophy that doesn't have a point because it's a situation. And then when you don't find the point, you say, yep, it's a waste of time. And you go do something else in hopes of finding a meaning that was found in the thing you just walked past because it didn't have a point because it was a higher resolution. So it goes with novels. So it goes with being a human being. So it goes with fully living. But by definition, that means you find situations in the leaping into the situation of which you won't find a point to do until you do it. Because the point is the doing. It is the full unfolding of the way of life. But that means you dive in and then you're like, this is great. Yeah, but it's like, but the door was shut until you opened it. You had to open it and jump in. But you could always find a reason not to open the door. You could say, well, it's locked. Well, have you tried the handle? No. Well, how do you know it's locked? What well, it has to be locked because otherwise it'd be opened. Try it. You know, C.S. Lewis said that hell was a, a room with a door locked from the inside. I think that goes for most of our lives. I think that's what we, we as human beings tend to do. We tend to put ourselves in rooms out of fear, out of not wanting to be seen as wasting our time, as not wanting to be seen as doing something pointless. We as human beings reduce ourselves to a room that is locked from the inside. And then we never try the handle because we're like, what's the point? It's locked. Well, because it's not locked. Well, you don't know that. Well, why don't you know that? Because you haven't touched the handle. Why haven't you touched the handle? Because that would be pointless. And now you're stuck in a self-fulfilling prophecy, a self-justifying logic that keeps you in that locked room. And one day you wonder why you've never left this room and why you, <clears throat> and why you never thought to leave. Well, because you never tried the handle. Well, why didn't you try the handle? Because there was always a good reason not to. And then life's over. Um, 